these five people are worth over half a billion pounds and are ready to invest their own money in the best business ideas they hear. But will anyone convince them to part with their cash? You've just lost me completely, my interest. <laughs> I'm not going to risk my money on a gambler with no experience. I've never seen anything quite so ridiculous, to be perfectly honest. It's not an investment for me. I don't believe in you, and I don't believe in the product. I think it's the most utterly ridiculous business idea. Dragon's Den, five multimillionaires are about to arrive, ready to invest hundreds of thousands of pounds of their own cash in new business ideas. They'll meet aspiring entrepreneurs who'll pitch their ideas and ask for as much money as they want. So who are our five millionaires, the dragons in the den? There's only one rule. They must get at least what they asked for or they don't get a penny. First into the Dragon's Den is Graham Whitby. Now, he gave up a well-paid marketing job to risk everything on a new invention he's helping launch. He's looking for an investment of £150,000. But remember, he has to get at least that amount or he goes away with nothing. Thank you for your patience. My name is Graham Whitby and I'm the Managing Director of Baby Dream Machine Limited. Today we're looking for an investment of £150,000. The Baby Dream Machine? Well, my... We, uh, we... The business... I, I'm a father of three, okay? So, very sorry. I'm a father of three. And we started off, uh, my wife and I, had, when we have had our first child, we went into uh, having horrendous sleepless nights. And so when we moved on to having our second... Oh dear, oh dear, no. no I'm going to start again. Come on. So, my name's Dream Whitby and I'm the Managing Director of Baby Dream Machine Limited. We're here today looking for £150,000. I'm a father of three and when we had our first child, was uh, enough to put anybody off parenthood, it really was. So we, uh, when we first started out with the venture, the business, I can't do it. Okay. Would you like to answer questions? No, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start again, I'm gonna compose myself. Okay, I'm the managing director of Baby Dream Machine Limited. We, we are today here looking for 150,000 pounds. The pitch is a vital part of getting investment. But Graham's nerves have got the better of him. So just, just tell us what the thing does and switch it on and okay. work. Well, the machine itself is quite straightforward. You have uh, a child is inside the push chair, and it's quite simple to operate. We have you switch it off. It's got two speeds on the machine. It starts off with. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> it's dreadful. Um, leaving aside your obvious nervousness, do you put a baby in this thing and do they fall asleep? They do fall asleep, yeah. We've got plenty of video footage of the machine actually uh, working. So it works? It, it does work, yes. And how much are you going to charge for the thing? It'll be in the order of between 100 to 150 pounds. And actually, are, there any, are there any health regulations? Sorry? Are there any no. health or safety regulations you have to overcome we've for this thing? We've majigger? designed the machine so that, uh, so that it uh, complies to all the necessary regulations and standards. It's a, it's a simple push-button operation as well, so you press the button, 15 minutes it'll operate for, the parent will go to sleep, 
hopefully the child will go to sleep. We can't guarantee that the machine will send the child to sleep. But, yeah. uh, but at the end of the day, can guarantee it's the it rocking and soothing motion that you get from the machine. That's, <laughs> it that's really quite is. Do you know, I found myself, I think this is a product for the parents as well as the child. It's very, very... <laughs> I'm sitting like here completely... It sends you into Look at my sort of head. I'm mesmerised. I don't know why you, why you want us to invest. I don't know why you don't go to mother care. I say, we've invented this fantastic thing. You sell it in your shops. You give me some money and you can have the contract. We don't necessarily want to sign up sole rights with any retailer. And I think if a, if a retailer was to come to us at this point, they'd be looking for sole rights to the market. And who's okay. we, Graham? We, um, there's myself and there's Barry, who's the inventor. I can't claim to, uh, to have invented this product, uh, as fantastic as it is. Uh, my background's been in product manufacture, electronics manufacture. That's how Barry and myself got together. The inventor's called Barry Hay. Graham, have you got um, Barry with you? Barry is downstairs, yes, and I'd love to bring him up. Yeah, do you want to bring can, him up? Yeah, yeah. The Dragons are about to meet ex-builder Barry Haig, the inventor of the baby dream machine. Right. Hello. Hi, Barry. I'm Barry Haig, the inventor who invented this. Uh, I come up with the idea about 32 years ago when my own children were born. Been working hard and paying mortgages and that, and you don't have time to do anything. And when my grandson was born, and I had this problem again with babies, uh, I were semi-retired, so I decided to uh, make it. <clears throat> and over the years, I've, you know, made it to what it is now. I mean, I've, quite, I've made quite a few prototypes, but the first one, I, I've got one that's like prehistoric, if I showed you, but it did the job. I mean, I got a baby to sleep on the first one I made from screaming its head off in about 30 seconds. And since then, I've got numerous babies to sleep. Barry, I think, I think we all believe the concept works. You don't have to sell the concept to us. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we're all with you, we've all got children. With Graham and Barry growing in confidence, the Dragons are impressed enough to start talking figures. So let's say I said, OK, I'll invest 150k. How much of your business are you offering me for it? We're offering 5% of our business, 5% equity in the business. So you're valuing a company that does not yet exist at £3 million. Doesn't that sound Indeed. a bit rich? Nope, because it's got your interest. I uh, know actually you just lost my interest. And mine. Okay. Okay, guys, five, three, three million pre-money value at a prototype? No. I mean, businesses of this measure go for half a million, three quarters of a million mm -hmm. max. Mm -hmm. that, that's just where it is. Mm -hmm. If you want to retain that kind of control, then you got to find your 150 out of family, friends, and fools. Mm -hmm. I'm not your family, I'm not your friend, and I don't care to be the latter. Okay. If I was to negotiate with you before I started, I'd have to know what the exit strategy was. Yes. What's the exit strategy? The exit strategy for the business is that it will be up for sale from immediate effect, from product hitting the market, um, and we anticipate that we'll be selling out the business within three to five years. What, what kind of price? Okay, price depends on the business. Depends how the sales go. No, it doesn't depend on how the sales go. We, we, have, got a, we have got a figure. Give us a figure. The sales figure for the business. To sell a business, to sell a company. Is going to be in the order of about 600 million. That would be nice if it was possible. I don't think it's possible. I think that's a bit... But that's what, the right. that's what our figures are showing us. That's, what one, that's based on unit sales of 5 million in the world market, developed world market. 5 million well, units. You know, the good news is you don't lack for aspiration, guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, we're gonna go out and I hate when people under pitch. Yes. So yeah. It's hard for me to criticize when they over pitch. Mm -hmm. this, man's, yeah. this man's recruited me to look after his best interests. And we're going to do that, aren't we? Mm. Yeah. Certainly. And if this isn't the right forum, then so be <clears> it. it. Mm -hmm. I think your current valuation of your business is completely out of kilter. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you have to start to be realistic now and start coming back to us to say, look, guys. We, we're open now to real offers, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you stick fast on your 5% mm -hmm. for 150000 If you stick fast, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to be involved. Graham and Barry want £150,000, but they're only offering 5% of their business. The Dragons want more for their money. I'd be willing to invest 50000 for 5%. Can we confer quietly? You can confer quietly or loudly, whatever you like. <coughs> no, we might as well go as we're going. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. No, we might as well carry on going down the road we're going. 
Sorry, but no. I mean... Okay, then. I mean, yeah. we want to get some made, get them on the market, and we'll walk before we can run. Make a few, sell a few. Make I mean, few, we're, getting the, a we're getting the patents on it, I mean, and we've got a good patent on it. We have, a, we have had the examiner's report saying it is patentable, it, isn't, it is novel. So... I mean, when you run out of money, give me a ring. Okay. Right then. Thank okay. you. Thanks I think we're right. exactly on the same basis. I, I was very interested. Um, I think the product's fantastic. I think that if you realigned your expectations, then it would be a good Im investment to make. But at that stage, on that value, it's not. So I'm pulling out as well. No, that's okay. Okay. I won't be investing. Sorry. And so you know where you stand. Oh. I'm out. Right. So you know who to address yourself to. Only two of the dragons have shown any interest, and even they're wavering. Now Graham and Barry are struggling. I'm still in. Uh, I also invest £50,000 for 5%, subject to you raising £150,000 here today. Graham and Barry's fate is in the hands of Doug Richard. He can make or break the deal. Gentlemen, I have a real challenge with you guys. Um, I have no disrespect for what you've accomplished at all. You've accomplished a great deal so far. Um, you've got a product to prototype and to manufacture ability. It's a, it's a huge accomplishment. But you know so little about the other elements of business. Even how you're trying to arbitrate amongst us reinforces my concern. Um, and so, bottom line, I'm out. Right, that's fair enough. So, we haven't done it. So it's been really nice seeing you all. <laughs> really nice talking to you. Okay. After a gruelling session in the Dragon's Den, Graham and Barry are forced to leave empty-handed. They impress the investors with their product, but not their negotiating skills. How can you invest in that? One big chance to get a product launched, and you completely blew it. And you know what the sad thing is? That it, their product will happen. It just won't happen for them. Yeah. Now, look, uh, Graham, you had a terrible start. At the bottom of the stairs, I was absolutely prime for anything. I could have, I could have uh, taken a, I could have stormed to the, uh, the, the, the Eiffel Tower, whatever. But uh, no, when I got up there, it was a case of I just completely forgot everything I had to say. I looked at the product. I just, I just couldn't focus on anything. I, and I, I don't, it's nerve-wracking, isn't it? It's it, nerve it was nerve-wracking, but I, I can't say that I was nervous. It was just a case of it's quite a surreal moment. <laughs> you were holding out for a very high price for those shares, though. I mean, they were, they were there. They were there. They were going to put money in your hands, and you just. We have, a, we have a product that we have a lot of belief in, and we know that it's going to go somewhere. It's going to, it's going to start to sell, and I think we were asking a small price for our shares, to be honest with you. It's how life is, I'm afraid. So. Yeah. <laughs> now the other thing that came up, a hot issue. These guys loved the product. Yes. They didn't quite think you were the people to really take it to market. Did yes. They? Mm -hmm. No, they didn't. Now, do you think they've got a point there, or do you think they were being unfair? Good people cost a lot of money, and we need some money to the table first. We have a product that we know is going to hit the market tail end of this year, and so we have the confidence that when we have some revenue, yes, we do know that we need some good, strong people to the team. Next up is Gavin Drake, who's organising a new music and arts festival. He wants £100,000 from the Dragons to help him get it off the ground. Nice to meet you all. Hi. My name's Gavin. Gavin Hello. Drake. Hello, Gavin. Nice to meet you all. Finally, at last. Hi, Gavin. Hi. Nice Hi. to meet you. Hi. OK. Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Gavin Drake, and I'm the driving force behind Art Out There, contemporary arts and music events. Um, the business, Art Out There, requires £100,000 investment plus an optional loan at £100,000 at 3% above base. So, Art Out There. An annual exclusive contemporary arts and music weekend event located on a London, central London park within a purpose-built fence site. Um, over 30,000 members of the paying public at a competitively priced £35 per day coming together to enjoy what will truly be an unforgettable summer's weekend event. The most innovative arts and music festival Arts and Music Weekend event to uh, be found within London, answering to the demands of the world's most culturally creative city. 
we have a very strong relationship with Peter Express. We actually have a contract with Peter Express in the supply of to-go units and restaurants, which will increase the exclusivity and the target market for our audiences. Uh, in exchange for the returns for the investment, Art Out There is prepared to offer up to 49% of the business. I mean, it is hoped that the investor will bring key skills and expertise to the table. So a combination of business now and creativity, um, I present to you Art Out There. Thank you very much. Gavin's looking for £100,000 in exchange for 49% of his business. Gavin, I may have missed part of this. So what exactly happens at the event? Okay. What, why are they coming? I've heard everything but the thing somehow. Okay, the reason that 70% of the people are coming, 75% of the people are coming, is because of the live music performances. Live music from the most up-to-date... So who do you have? We don't have any. We have lineups. So who are you going to have? We're going to have... A, there's a, there's a, my pre preference would be to have, as a headline on one a day, uh, an act called The Gotham Project, who are French Argentinian tango performers. They have done Raw Festival Hall and the Barbican, and, and they're doing very well. They're touring the world. And they're middle-aged musicians produced by a young producer, and the music is absolutely fantastic. The other acts would include perhaps the Gypsy Kings, which is, introduces some flamenco music. Um, but maybe we would use smaller acts to, to help promote smaller musical acts rather than big names. Other acts would be Herbie Hancock, Roy Ayers, um, and, and then lots and lots and lots of other contemporary sort of music acts, live music acts. Can you just tell me a little bit about yourself and, and wh where you fit into this? Wh what will you be doing? Well, I would be the key man in the fact that the relationships and the intangible assets that I own um, are through myself. The relationship with council, um, the key members and expert team which I have um, are all through myself. My background is music, fashion, arts and events. Well, what do you do for a living at the moment? At the moment, I'm setting up a project called Jazz well, what Now. What do you actually do for a living? What, what do you do for a living? If you want a definition, I'm an entrepreneur. I work alongside creatives um, and produce projects. I think you may be a good salesman, Gavin, but this is, this is not an investment for me. That's I... your choice. I mean, I, I, that's good. I'm glad you're pointing this out to me. From now on, I'll try and direct my questions and, and answers to the people who may be interested. Because okay. for me, I need the right person to, to support this, this idea. Duncan Bannatyne is already out. Now Gavin must convince the other dragons to come up with the investment he needs, £100,000. I'll have a go at talking to you. Um, this is a very, very high-risk business, isn't it? I don't think so. I know because I spent quite a bit of the 80s in your world, so I know your world, I'll give you that. There's a lot of people who have lost their shirt on these big events, haven't they? There are. Yeah. And have you, this is the first one you've ever done. It's the first one for Clapham Common, yes. But it's the first one you've ever done of any event art out that you've ever done. No, I've organised music and hip hop, like Music Weekenders, for three and a half thousand people on a budget of hundred thousand. So you've done a three and a half thousand yes, festival. Yes. And what's it called? It's called Deadbeat. So you're asking me to take my own money and put it into this gamble of a one-off event that if it rains, we've got a problem. We can also buy, if so required, plural, like pluralism. Pluvius insurance policy. Which so I've heard about all that. If we don't sell the tickets, we've got a problem. All I'm trying to get to is, I know what these events are like. There's a, it makes, it's what I call Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And this is Mrs. Murphy's Law, which is my old man's an optimist. OK, let me ask you, how come the likes of Pizza Express have issued me a contract, 60-40% in my favour, to be part of my festival? I, I don't know, and you know, it may well be because they've just said, um, yeah, well, if he pulls it off, we'll sell some pizzas there or we'll advertise, but we're not, I bet they haven't signed a contract with you yet. I can have a contract right here to show you, so if you, you like. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so you've got all these kind of... One second. Rachel Elno has questions for Gavin, but he's determined to convince Peter Jones that his contracts are credible. Can, can we just have a, can I have a quick look at some, a couple of contracts you're talking about? I can show you a um, signed contract from Peter Express. And... Oh, look at that one. But Gavin's paperwork raises more questions than it answers. Having just seen the contracts that you just put in front, which the team obviously need to see, 
just some immediate feedback on that. For, firstly, the, they're, they're certainly not contracts, so I think your understanding of contracts is, is slightly a bit misinterpreted. A, a contract between two parties where monies are changing hands on one way and from a sponsorship perspective means that you, as the venue owner, would hand a contract to Pizza Express. Pizza Express would actually then pay you, the venue owner, something for that. You have a letter there that actually says that we will go on site and provide a Pizza Express function for you, but charge you £6,000 for the usage of that. Yes. And if we do make any money outside of that, we'll distribute some profits up yes. along the way. And then you've but, got uh, um, a letter from Lambeth Parks that tells you that they didn't have any objection to you putting a show on in September 2002, two oh, years ago. Yes. And the next step for you is to go and consult with all the, the police and the ambulance and everything, which is really a letter that anybody could get simply by writing to and, them and, and asking them and, uh, for it. I'm not saying that that Pizza Express contract is a contract. Uh, I, I have used that terminology. What I, want, what I would like to ex exemplify to you is what I've achieved so far for this project. Gavin's already lost Simon Woodruff. Will Rachel Elno help him out? Rachel? Oh, oh me, Gavin. Oh, well, that was a long second. Um, earlier on, you said I one second. I must apologise. That was a hell of a long second. OK, I hope you accept my apologies. The most important thing for me, Gavin, in business is to work with people I like. OK. It's the most important criteria, and I'm afraid. Well, you I don't first. like you. Oh, and sorry. You, you were rude to me, and you've come across actually as not the kind of person well, that I would want to work with I in must business. I apologise. So I won't be investing. I must Thank apologise you. if I was rude to you. I was merely answering the questions which, which were ongoing. I apologise for that. But that's, if that's. Well, yeah, and I got good news for you. I'm American, and therefore I obviously am complete, completely immune to insult. Um, um, but I'm also not going to invest. It's not one for me. I think Fine. it's too high risk. Okay. But Thank you for your time, anyway. Thank you. It's, thank you for your constructive criticism. Good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. All the best. It's all over for Gavin, who's been savaged in the Dragon's Den. What an obnoxious guy. Rachel, on behalf of Absolutely. all men, I apologise for Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, what better way to lose any potential investment than, than to be rude when you're doing a pitch and you want money from people? I thought the personality, your, your personality clashed with one or two of them, obviously. Indeed, indeed. And that got in the way of yes. the business proposition, didn't yes. it? Yes, it did. What about Rachel, the... Uh... Well, she can... Well, I'll be polite, because this is television, after all. She got the wrong end of the stick. She interrupted me whilst I was answering a question to another member of the board. I, quite rightly, asked her to hold on for one second and continued in my questions and then was asked another question by another investor, and not you, given the opportunity forgot, to, uh, not just, giving the opportunity yeah. to return to her, but she didn't show any interest. She wasn't interested in what I had to say. Why did she say that? Why did she come out with that, oh, I don't like you? What use is that? Other entrepreneurs who tried and failed to excite our millionaires included Paul Clark, who wanted the Dragons to invest in his business selling car styling to boy racers. We're about to launch Incarnation, where performance styling will be sold as an automotive Disney experience. Duncan Bannatyne gave him short shrift. It's crazy, it doesn't work, and I'm not going to waste any time, I'm not investing in you. The market is growing. It's a growth market. And Peter Jones thought it was a Mickey Mouse idea. One word always has stayed with me right to the end, and that is Disneyland, because I actually think, personally, the product set probably is deliverable in Disneyland, because I think, personally, you're in Dreamland. Right. Flattering the dragons is always worth a try. Oh, ye dragons of might and mystery, my name is Mubashir Khanzada, and this evening I bring it the an idea of fabulous magnitude that will increase thy gold and increase thy treasure many fold. But Ian McCormack's pouch for extinguishing cigarettes sparked a row about smoking. All you do with this is you just drop your cigarette into it and um, it's easily placed into your pocket. Now, I'm surprised that, that you say that 30% of smokers are considerate. I think it's a lot less than that. 
I've never met a considerate smoker. You haven't? No. Well, you're talking to one of them. Duncan Bannatyne was having none of it. I have no interest in this product because it's, it's involved with smoking and it's eth ethically I wouldn't get involved in it. And so I am absolutely not investing in it. And so I'm out. <laughs> Next up to face the dragons is Joanne Morrison from Glasgow. She's looking for an investment of £60,000. But remember, Dragon's Den rules dictate she has to get at least that amount or she leaves empty handed. Hi, my name's Joan Morrison, and along with my business partner Emma McPherson, we're looking for an investment of £60,000 to enable us to build the Emma and Joe fashion label into one of the most exclusive and prominent fashion brands in the UK. As a starting point for Emma and Joe, we hope to open a boutique in the west end of Glasgow. This is one of the most affluent areas in the city. The garments will be manufactured out with the shop, brought back in and hand finished by us in the studio area of the shop. Our main unique selling point is that most of the garments are one-off garments because they are hand-finished by ourselves. We know this business is going to work because we've researched the market. Emma and myself both stock ranges in the west end of Glasgow, which both sell well. Emma runs her own bespoke company at the moment. I manage a fabric shop, so I've got the managerial experience. We just need this as a next step to take the company further. This is our dream and we want to offer women the shop of their dreams. So, you're not just looking at investing in one shop in Glasgow, you're investing in an exclusive brand which can grow and grow throughout the UK, throughout Europe, the possibilities are endless. We believe in it, we're going to do it, we're just, it's up to you if you want to invest in it. Joanne Morrison is looking for £60,000 and is prepared to give away 20% of the business. I'd like to just ask a few questions. You said it's your, clearly your dream? Yes. Can you tell me about that? What, it's your dream to own a shop and run a shop and do something for yourself? Is that... Yeah, we've both got degrees in fashion and we both do stock our own ranges in shops in Glasgow at the moment. But we need this to take it a step further and to be able to make our living from doing what we love doing and also fill a huge gap in the market that we found. Just one of the things, the way that I get the feeling though, it's that very much that you'll open the shop in Glasgow, but I don't see anything else happening outside of that. I see very much you've got that. You've now, you're living your dream, you, ho you own a shop. You're now in the centre of Manchester. What, what is going to sort of make me feel confident that after investing the money, that actually Manchester is going to work? We do have a lot of business contacts and advisors who can help us with that. But out with London, there's not really any stores like us. So wherever we go, we're going to be offering something unique. I've got some concerns, but I'd like to speak. I'd like to hear from the designers yeah, before sure. I decide. Okay. The Dragons want to question Emma McPherson, Joanne's business partner. Afternoon. Good afternoon. What can I help you with? Uh, you're the designer. Yep, the creative one. You design? Yep. OK, we're, we're just a little bit concerned that this is a sort of lifestyle business, almost a sort of one-man band. OK. And if the turnover isn't high enough to convince me of different, then I've nowhere to go. The turnover is high enough, believe me. Six I figures? work all over the world. Oh, yeah? I mean, my clothes sells. OK. I mean, this is, this is Emma and Joe. It's the clothes are completely different from what you get. This is made to measure. It fits me perfect. You know, it and it's unusual at the back as well. It is. And yep. it stands out from it's everybody very, else. Very, very nice. Um, what would you sell the that for? The jacket sells for £60. Now, that's a reasonable price, and anybody can get that. And, and the skirt? The skirt, you're costing, it's a lot more because there's nine metres of fabric in the skirt. Yeah. This is our costing strategy. You know, there's a metre and a half of fabric in what the jacket. What the skirt sell for? You're talking about 150 at the moment, I've got a client who I'm making an outfit for a wedding, and that's costing 800 and that's just a dress. OK? We need a place where clients come in the door, they see the clothes on the rails, and they see the shop in the back. I've got wealthy clients coming up to a flat in Glasgow. <laughs> now, that's not the space we need. It's clear that Duncan Bannatyne is impressed with Emma's designs, but can he be persuaded to put any money into the business? I'm interested in investing, but I wouldn't invest a total £60,000 in it. £60,000? <laughs> it is a lot of money to ask. I mean, I set up my company with £2,000, OK? I don't have an outlet. 
I don't have a nice place for clients to come. I don't have the nice packaging. I don't have the nice bags. I don't have all the stuff to make me progress to the next level. What I'm saying to you guys here is I have tried everything. It's not moving forward. It's not going places. Duncan Bannatyne has offered part of the cash, but will any of the other dragons take the investment up to £60,000? If I understand what you said, the core differentiator of your business is with a person in a shop that conforms the clothing to the person rather than the person to the clothing. And yet, what you brought up, Joanne, was the fact that a great deal of your profits as a business are going to come from your indirect sales through other shops. And you cannot reconcile the personal touch, which is your unique yes, selling you proposition, because you're going to have some person sitting in a shop somewhere who doesn't have your commitment, your style, your charm, any of it, trying to be you elsewhere. And as soon as you say that, everything that makes you unique fell away. And then it's you're not... just another clothing company. Okay, you've got ten dresses. They're all hanging on the rail. One's got a red button, one's got a blue button, one's got a purple button. One's... They're all completely different. Who's doing it for you where you're not? Up until this moment, what I understood was you, you're having a relationship with that person. We're having a relationship. Well, you're not having a relationship with the person you've never met, you don't know, in a shop in a distant city. Well, yes, we are, because they have a unique brand on that no one else has got. Because, OK, there's another girl with that dress on. She's not got the same dress as you on, because hers is a different colour. I don't think you're taking my point, and quite frankly, I do this is far, I, I far from my area of expertise. Side, but I, all I can do is wish you the best of luck. I think you have a fantastic idea for a shop. I'm very dubious you have a fantastic idea for a scalable brand. Sorry, I'm not investing. Despite Emma's determined defense of her bespoke brand, she's losing the dragons. I can see the real passion you have, and I, my heart really goes out to you, actually, because you're determined, you're gutsy, um, and I think this, this is a great idea for a boutique business, but I think to get investment on board, you've got to do something that's scalable, and, and would that take you away from the business, and I think actually you're the driving force, from what I can gather here, take you out of it, there's nothing left, and I think that's your biggest problem, and for that reason, I wouldn't invest in it. Emma and Joanne's hopes are now pinned on Simon Woodruff, Peter Jones and Duncan Bannatyne. I think you will get an investment. I think it'll be a small investment from somebody you already know. If you don't listen, you won't learn. I'm listening, but I've tried every avenue. There's no more avenues to try. So that's... Don't fall at the last fence. You've got a lot of passion, but you're not to go to investors you don't know is not the right place to go for what you're doing. You need to go for somebody who loves that. And I know people who've invested in fashion brands, not because they wanted to make a profit out of it, but because they love what you're doing and they had a lot of fun with it along the way. And I think somewhere in there you'll find somebody who will do that because they want you to succeed. I'm clearly not going to invest in, in, the, in the opportunity, but thanks for That's coming Thank you. Your decision, yeah. You're losing out on a brand, so... Only Duncan Bannatyne can now provide the £60,000 investment that Emma and Joanne need. I just don't see where there's any profit. I just don't think you have to, I think if you were making something, you'd be able to afford your own shop. And so I don't think there's any profit no, in it. I mean, you're, you're where we're wanting to be is in Glasgow and the West End. Mm -hmm. now, if any of you know the West End Glasgow, you'll know that the prices are sky high. You know, you're talking £25 per square foot. We need 750 square foot. You know, do your sums. It works out 45,000 just to get the shop fitted and everything up to the spoke we want. This is a high profile shop. I hope, I hope you've learned something from today and I hope you've listened. But um, this is not an investment for me, I'm going to pass on it. So none of the dragons were prepared to give Emma and Joanne their cash. It's tough for them to take. <laughs> You so much want it to be right, don't you? You so much want to invest in them because, you know, they've got this... Bit. Well, the fact that they're on the verge of tears... Yeah. It's it's and, and they've got an attitude which is... Well, we want to listen to the world. Do you want to listen to the world's yeah. unfair? Did you at any point think you were actually close to getting the money there? Did you? No, want... not at all. No? One didn't? of them, but I didn't think any of the other ones had grasped, did you, or were particularly trying to? And ultimately, you are going to be able to build a store out of this, at least, aren't you? And then you can just see whether that... No? There's not any money out there for this size of, you know, company. You know, banks will not give you anything if you're a young entrepreneur. 
there's that's it. That's the chance out the window. Entrepreneur Jeremy Davis also wants to be involved in the world of fashion, but his pitch for an ethical clothing range just didn't add up. I hope you did your maths homework last night, because today we're talking equations. What happens when you add A to B? Well, in the true spirit of maths, you get C. Peter Jones wasn't impressed with Jeremy's designs. On the thing that you've presented to us there, I've got an 11-year-old daughter that can probably draw slightly better than some of those designs. You probably would have done better not to have brought that in. Right in front of me at the moment, you're looking really poor as an individual, and I think it's going to get worse and worse and worse the more you talk about the business. You're nowhere in my book right now. You're not going to start that business. Yule Thompson's pitch for a golf advertising business didn't captivate Peter Jones either. My business idea involves displaying advertising in golf driving range bays throughout the UK. That's displaying advertising in golf driving range bays throughout the UK. You actually came across very condescending, I felt. So firstly, I'd just like to say that from a learning experience, I think that being condescending in front of uh -huh. you know, people that you should have respect for, I think, yeah. is, was a very poor approach. Rachel Fidesz has a stylish idea for a new type of hairdressers. Hi, I'm looking for £60,000 today. Um, and it's basically going towards the setup of the UK's first ever blow dry bar. Um, and almost, I've... almost advertised this as a hairdressing sound that doesn't go here. It's a blow dry bar. And what are you going to call it? Blow. Really? At least she has a brand name which should turn a few heads. I think they need a different name. Why? Because no. just the idea of a big store with the word blow on it just. It, I can think of so many ways. Would that, that would that get attention? That's God, a great yes. name. So why would you change it? So no deals yet done in Dragon's Den today. But remember, it is the Dragon's own money that's at stake. So the pitch has to be perfect. Is that what Charles the Jogu can deliver? He's a former investment banker, and he's looking for hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles Jogo. I'm here to pitch today the Umbrali vending concept. Um, we're looking for £150,000. Essentially, our business serves um, a, quite a niche. Um, we've developed the world's first and only um, umbrella vending machine, but it's a multimedia vending machine. And that also has a screen on the front of it through which we display um, TV type quality adverts. Um, we've actually won a contract to place this machine across the London Underground. It's an exclusive contract. There's 12 years to run with an option to renew as well at the end of the 12 years. And that's to place this unit across the entire network. There's 300 plus stations. We think there are about 150 stations that are viable in terms of the passenger footfall figures, um, also the, the demographic for people that will want to buy the advertising. That will give us access to about 60 to 70 percent of the daily users on that network which is in excess of two and a half million people so they have a chance to buy this product every day we sell it for two pounds which is a big selling point it's a lot cheaper than your retailers currently sell they sell for minimum seven pounds um, I think I've covered most of it I think Charles is looking for hundred and fifty thousand pounds and is prepared to give away 20% of his company can we have a look at the umbrella up? Awesome. Terrific. OK. Where did you get the idea from? Well, the idea came from myself and an old school friend. We were riding the underground, got to um, Parsons Green, end of the line for us, and it was raining heavily. So the only thing we needed then really was an umbrella. So um, we didn't have one. We had to walk home in the rain. And we thought at that moment it would be nice if there was you know, an opportunity, maybe a uniform opportunity across a rail network to buy something like that. Just simple, disposable, you use it, it gets you home and you're happy. 
So that's really where the idea was born from. What's your background? My background, um, I worked in the city for a couple of years. Um, I got made redundant from uh, Merrill Lynch. I worked there for two years after leaving university. So what was the first thing you did when you thought of the idea? Um, long process. Um, first thing was to find out if it had already been done. Um, we found that it hadn't. Um, then we needed to get a machine developed and also approach London Underground to see if we could actually put, you know, if it was, if it was something they would even consider, otherwise it would be a waste of time. It took from the first meeting to get to a contract stage um, and then to getting it signed over a year. But um, we've got a good contract, I mean, as I say. So when you're on that, let's just deal with that contract. Tell us about what you've got signed. OK. Um, there's 12 years left to run on the contract, um, basically. There's also clauses in there, so we've got options to renew, should we wish to, at the end of the period. Um, that allows us the exclusive rights, or it gives us the exclusive right, to vend umbrellas across the entire network. Charles has a potentially lucrative contract to place his umbrella vending machines on the London Underground. But the Dragon sense his business has even more to offer. You've combined a basic concept of selling umbrellas. And then I suspect what has happened is you realised you had a billboard that you weren't taking advantage of. Which is the more profitable business? It's basically split like this. Um, the adv advertising on the screen is probably worth double the branding and the umbrella sales. Aren't what you're really asserting is that you snuck billboards into the underground? So on some, in, on some level, this business is actually how to get more media advertising inside the London Underground, which is a very... Uh, I'm complimenting you, I'm not criticizing you. Take it for what it is. But I think one has to be very careful to know what one's investing in. Of course. Because the risks associated with the media business are different than the risks associated with whether, for example, it will rain in Britain. I have huge confidence it will rain in Britain. Doug Richard is impressed by Charles's vending machines, which will sell umbrellas and offer space for TV-style adverts on the London Underground. The other dragons want to know more. Have you got guaranteed prime sites for these? Well, this is it. The machine isn't going to go anywhere near the platforms. It's going to be in the exits and the ticket halls. The prime sites are essentially, as you're leaving a station, to be in direct line of sight of the rain and the machine. What sort of profit levels, when you build a business model when you're running at full tilt, what sort of profit expectations do you have? In the whole business? Yes. We're running at something like, I think it's between 60 and 70 percent profit. It may be slightly less, but to be honest with you, we don't have any costs. Once the machine is there, it lasts for five years. We've got no costs other than depreciation on the machine, and there's obviously labour going to the machine. Because that's our store, that's our main cost. I personally take the view you will not make a 60% net profit. Why? Because very, 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 very few businesses do. Chances are what simply has happened here is you have undercounted costs that you have not yet thought through. And I'd be happy even if you made 30%. In fact, I'd be thrilled if you made 30%. Um, what percentage of the company are you offering for 150000 20%. 20%. Now that's an interesting number. You're valuing the company at 600. Which personally I think is quite cheap. I'm confident that that's what you believe. It seems all five dragons are excited by Charles's umbrella vending machine, but his options are about to narrow. I think it's a great business. Um, I don't think it's a no-brainer. I can see some glitches along the way. No businesses, there's no license to print money in this world, but it doesn't really fit into my portfolio. So, I'm out. Simon Woodruff is ruling himself out of the deal, but Duncan Bannatyne has more questions. Look, look I, I'm interested in making an investment, but I'm not happy with the valuation on the company. So, is the amount of equity available for the money negotiable? It's about negotiable, I'd say, to a degree, yes. OK. The rules here are that you have to get all of your investment, and you've asked for 150000 So tell me what equity stake you would give for 150000 I think 20% is realistic. I know you think it, but if I was a company at 750000 and that's a bit high. The company's not making any money. Peter Jones is ready to pounce. Charles, I'm going to make this interesting now. I'm going to offer you £75,000 for 22% of your company. OK. You need to find the other money, but I'm committed to offering it. And I think that where I can add value in your business, 
especially with some of the advertising things that you were discussing, I think hopefully you're going to say yes. But Duncan Bannatyne wants to be part of the deal too. Charles, I'm, I'm also happy to offer you, to offer you £75,000 for 22%. So that means you've got your, your money, £150,000. But we're looking for 44% of the equity of your company. And we believe we can improve your company and help you take the company forward. We, we believe there's added value. I believe there's added value, and I believe there'll be added value from Peter too. Um, so for £150,000, 44% of your company, we want to go with you now. Jones and Duncan Bannatyne have offered £75,000 each for 44% of the company in total. Charles arrived only wanting to sell 20%. The stakes have become too high for Rachel Elno. Charles, I'm happy for you to continue the negotiation with the other two, so I'll step back from the deal. So therefore there's only one offer on the table. That's 75000 from Peter. 75,000 from me, 150,000. We get 44% of the new equity of the company. Charles is hoping Doug Richard will make a bid to rival Peter Jones and Duncan Bannatyne's offer. What I was going to say was, would you like to make an offer into the business? Is that what you were going to say? I was going to ask to see if there was maybe some, some alternative. I also absolutely do not agree with your 20% equity position. You have just said to two other people here that you feel that they are asking for too much, so I'll make me an offer. I think that 150,000 at best case scenario for yourselves as investors and worst case scenario for me is worth about 25%. Not nearly close enough. Charles needs to keep Doug interested, otherwise his only option is Peter Jones and Duncan Bannatyne's offer. They want 44% of Charles's company for £150,000. £150,000 is not easy to raise. Make me an offer. I'd say that the only, the last offer, and I think in the interest of getting the business running, the last offer that I'd probably give... Just before you think of that number, Charles, think really, really carefully. This is a finite time, potentially, in your life. Just take a couple more seconds just to think before you say the words last final offer. What I was going to say was, can I get a tissue of some sort to cool down? I'm a bit hot. I've asked you to make me an offer. I've got a ceiling, that, uh, there's a ceiling limit that I'll go to. Do feel free to tell me what that is. 30%. That's the ceiling. I, I've got to tell you, that's still too low even for me. I'm sorry. I'm out. So Charles must try to do a deal with Peter Jones and Duncan Bannatyne, who are holding out for a very large chunk of his company. So I'm left with one offer. I think you're asking for too much equity, so if there's flexibility on your side downwards, then yes. If it's sticking at 44%, then no. Well, thanks for your time. Thank you. Any regrets at the moment? Not really. I need to... I think... Will you be able to roll out your business plan? Will you be able to develop what you've got to do? Do you actually know the impact of... Before you start to go through a rollout programme, you've not done this before, you've not had a business before, you have limited experience, in two to three fundamental areas. Do you want to walk away with the opportunity of perhaps closing down something that actually is very important? I think... I don't obviously don't want to walk away, but I think 44% is too big, taking into consideration the actual value that you're, you'd both add. I think if you're willing to go at 35%, then we'd have a deal. No. Duncan Bannatyne is refusing to budge. 
Charles must hope that Peter Jones is willing to compromise. I think that, from my perspective, as I said at the start, I didn't want to negotiate on the point of, uh, and I understand your position, what I am willing to do is meet you somewhere between the two. Even though I did say originally I will not compromise, and to be fair, you know, you've always kept it fairly open. I think if I meet you halfway, so if we were at a point where I changed my holding down to 20%, and if you had a, another upper for another dragon at 20%, I'd be prepared to do that. Okay. But that would depend then whether the other dragon would be willing to do that. You'd need to convince them. Okay. So I'm left with one for 75 for 20. Any other interested dragons for the well, same? Of course, you can give me 22 percent for 75 percent for, for you can for 75 thousand. You can still do that. So you're only giving away 42 percent now, not 44. My offer's still on the table. 75 thousand for 22 percent. You wouldn't be willing to do 20. So that's the that's the final offer, and there's no. My final offer is 75,000 for 22 percent. For 22. If that's the final offer, um, then I'll accept the offer. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. A bit hard. Charles has got his investment, but emotions are running high. Duncan Bannatyne has managed to get 2% more of the company than Peter Jones for exactly the same price. Thanks very much. Cheers. Peter Jones is not happy. You know, some of us got it, some of us don't, you know? I think we've got to be careful, Doug, because that's a bit sly, to be honest, what you just did. It wasn't sly at all. I'm I just surprised did, you didn't. changed my I'm offer. Surprised well, I would have done, but that. you've just you've just put a guy on the bloody edge here and you were, and you've done a deal. You've just completely been a sly little Oh, are we going to work together in this company? I, I, to be honest, I probably not want to work with you after what you just did. So, I made um, an offer and didn't change it. I'm shocked. You're not, that's not good, good style. You know it. You don't do things like that. Like what? Not you change my bid? You don't, you don't. You don't try and work a deal like that and then create it and then try and turn the deal around and then retract it and then stitch pretty much two people up that you're doing the deal with. Give him your two percent back. I'll give it back. Two dragons will have to work together to make Charles's business a success, so they decide to offer him a new deal. Charles, I've reflected on the deal that we just made. I think I should only take 20% of the shareholder instead of 22, and I'm quite confident you'll accept that. Definitely. OK, well, once again, thanks, thanks very much. much. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. Well done. Very good. Cheers. Charles, I look forward to seeing you as Entrepreneur of the Year. I think the opportunity is there. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you very much. We invest the product's good, but we're investing in you. We believe in you. Thanks very much. You're going to do well. Charles has done it. He's tamed the dragons and is walking away with £150,000 in exchange for 40% of his company. Charles, well done. That was quite an ordeal. You've satisfied. Definitely, yeah. I think we got a good deal. Um, the dragons can add a lot of value. They've got a massive amount. Of right, when you walked in, what was your real last final offer that you were willing to go up to in selling the company? To be honest, I didn't have one because I didn't know what kind of investors they were and who they were, but I think... But you weren't expecting to come here, though, and give away 40% of the company. How do you feel about that? Uh, they've got the business skills that we need to take the business to the next level. So I think we've done a good deal. Now, what about that little um, episode of the first the first deal as agreed? It was 22% for one, 20% for the other. A little bit of argy-bargy up there about whether that was honourable. What was your impression when you were called up again to, uh, um, to, to face them? I wasn't too sure what to expect. I thought we were going to go up and hear that the deal had been cancelled or something, but so I, was, I was happy to hear that they're still going to go ahead. A revolutionary new idea for our time. Thank Very well much. done. Well done, Charles. Thank you.
It's been an extraordinary day in the Dragon's Den, although only Charles Ajogu impressed the Dragons enough to do a deal. He walks away with an investment of £150,000. But any entrepreneur scorched by their experience here should remember the words of Thomas Watson, the founder of IBM. Business is a game, the greatest game in the world, if you know how to play it. Goodbye. Next week on Dragon's Den is a good concept, but you doing it doesn't ring true. So you have a certain sort of arrogance. This is not a company. The best thing about today is the fact that you haven't given up your day job.